Welcome back to Watch the Bookerman and to episode number 44 of Paul Heyman's TNA 2010. Tonight's show is the first episode of Impact after No Surrender, which of course is the final pay-per-view before 10 10 10 Bound for Glory is the biggest show in the TNA calendar and we're trying to put over this year's as the biggest show in TNA history. The match card that I've got penciled in certainly stands up in my eyes to any other that the company's ever put on but just as important as the matches that you put together is the build to those shows. That final stretch begins tonight. Hopefully we can lay down a marker, set the ball rolling for what I hope can be four great episodes of Impact before Bound for Glory 10-10-10. And speaking of laying down that marker, a 99 rated segment, it couldn't have come at a more perfect time. So happy to get our best ever segment to kick off this really, really important episode of Impact. And we do begin with the World Heavyweight Champion. Who else could pull out ratings like that? And he puts over his defence of the title against Samoa Joe last Sunday. And the fact that he, Kurt Angle, is going into the biggest show in the TNA calendar as the World Heavyweight Champion. As Kurt puts over the level of challenge that Samoa Joe brought to him, he is cut off by the music of AJ Styles. AJ comes down to the ring and tells Kurt to forget about Joe because the phenomenal one is going to deal with him in tonight's main event, following up on their issues that they've had in the build-up to No Surrender. There was that rivalry bubbling under with them, so we're going to get some resolution to that as well tonight. And after AJ Styles has beat Samoa Joe, they can both focus on each other, because AJ wants his rematch against Kurt Angle at Bound for Glory. At Genesis 2010, Styles beat Angle. At Lockdown 2010, Angle beat Styles to become the TNA World Heavyweight Champion once again, and AJ wants the final match between the two of them to take place on 10-10-10, the biggest TNA show ever. Kurt Angle says that he saw AJ's performance at No Surrender, and he knows how tough of a challenge Desmond Wolf presents. He was impressed, and he sees that AJ is on the top of his game. He accepts the challenge provided AJ makes it out of his match with Samoa Joe. So there's not much more you can say, and there's certainly no negative to take out of this segment. Not only does the rating lay down a marker, I also wanted the booking of this segment to lay down a marker that the first segment after the previous pay-per-view we're already announcing pretty much the main event of the next pay-per-view. It's subject to confirmation via Paul Heyman, of course, but both guys want the match, and the storyline name kind of gives away the fact that it will happen, obviously gaining heat to the storyline with this segment. Kurt coming out looking well, both improvising well, even the commentary helping us, the crowd hotter, getting the show off to a strong start. Like I said, could not have asked for a better way to kick off as we go then into the opening match of the night and it's Strong's debut as a member of the New Age and he defeats Nick Jackson with a double knee gut buster, a good performance from Roderick Strong, okay performance from Nick Jackson, the match overall comes out pretty well and we're just putting over this is Strong's debut as a member of the New Age. After the match though, as Matt Jackson checks on his brother, we see that their friend Roderick Strong shows no interest whatsoever, he is fully on board with the New Age, he didn't necessarily want to join them but in this month that he is stuck with them, he is fully committing Jimmy Jacobs enters the ring with Mick Foley and pays tribute to the man who has brought everything together for them. The New Age can't thank Mick Foley enough, but Jimmy Jacobs also can't say too much because only he, Mick Foley, Alyssa Flash and Mischief know the true extent of what is coming. Given he's only on a trial, we're putting over there that even Roderick Strong doesn't know the full extent of what they have planned. Mick thanks Jimmy Jacobs for his kind words and says that he is proud to have used his power and his influence to make a mark on the next generation of wrestling. TNA will soon stand for the new age. Jacobs adds that Mick is an inspiration to every veteran who has ever stepped foot in this business because he is the first to truly give back what this industry has given to them. Nobody ever knows how long they have left. But Mick has ensured that the torch keeps burning and his legacy lives long after he is gone. Mick Foley will live forever through the new age. Jimmy then 
hugs Mick Foley, holding on for a long time. There's tears in his eyes. We really want to put this over as a emotional moment for Jimmy Jacobs, who is finally seeing everything that he's had planned for 10 months come together. Roderick Strong, slightly more understated, shakes hands with Mick Foley, who then puts over the project that he believes will push the envelope and upset the established order just like Mick Foley did 20 years ago. He didn't fit into the mould back then and these guys don't fit into the mould right now but they are, whether anybody likes it or not, the future of professional wrestling. Jimmy Jacobs struggling when going off script but it's still a solid segment Mick Foley coming across well, heading to then a studio setting, Mike Tanay is joined by Explosion commentator Arda O'Cal as they discuss the events of No Surrender. After talking through the results on that card, they put over the news coming out of the show. Tonight, Sting will appear in the ring to call out Jeff Hardy, who has confirmed that he will be at the building tonight. Paul Heyman has also confirmed a new signing, who will make their first TNA appearance on tonight's show. Ada says that there's been a lot of speculation about who this signing is, but all he knows is that they are coming into one of the most competitive and difficult locker rooms of all time, and coming in in Bound for Glory season makes it all the more difficult. Mike puts over that not only do we have AJ Styles and Samoa Joe in the main event, which we already mentioned, two other top-level competitors are going one-on-one -on -one later tonight, as Brian Kendrick faces Desmond Wolf. Kendrick looking to get back into the World Heavyweight Championship picture that he was briefly in a couple of months back, while Desmond Wolf desperately needs to get his momentum back. It's a really poor segment. Thankfully, I kept it sort of vague and general enough that it isn't actually attached to any storylines. Both guys doing badly without a script. I probably should have scripted that in retrospect. We then go elsewhere and a 42 rating for a segment rated on Sting's overness shows the influence of the ice cold momentum that he has. I don't think it could be any worse. He's supposed to be a special attraction, but while he's been off screen, his momentum's just been tanking and tanking, which I don't really think is my fault because I want to use him only occasionally, but... It's what's happened in the game. I thought that one thing that might help is changing his gimmick from the crow to the icon could help and it gets a very good rating which is a relief we just see footage from earlier today the icon sting has arrived at the building maro and taz comment that jeff had it isn't here yet but paul Heyman has had confirmation that the charismatic enigma is on his way to the building and will be here for his face to face with sting we then go into the second match of the night which is another i mean that's three really poor segments in a row it is two decent performances from the world tag team champion so not too much to worry about there as they defeat aeroform in four minutes and 51 when alex shelley pinned double l with a slice bread number two flip kendrick and lewis linden or london basically the surnames being pretty much London and Kendrick meant that I had to change them, so we went with Double L and Flip K. They're just some guys who we've been using in Evolve, who are brought over on a one-time deal. Judging on the ratings, they probably won't be brought back, but this match was all about showcasing Motor City Machine Guns, and hopefully, despite that rating, they did do a good job. Alex Shelley and Chris Sabin then each take a microphone after the match and say that after retaining their titles at No Surrender, they've been speaking with Paul Heyman. The Motor City Machine Guns have had the best year of their careers and they wanted to mark it with something special at Bound for Glory. Paul had an idea and they loved it. On 10-10-10, they'll defend their World Tag Team Championships against two teams in full Metal Mayhem 5. Next week, four teams will face off in two matches. The winner of each of those matches going on to join them in that full Metal Mayhem and earning an opportunity to challenge for the World Tag Team titles at the biggest show of the year. Bound for Glory will see the return of TNA's version of the Tables, Ladders and Chairs match. After that incredible 99 to start the show, it's been downhill. I do have confidence that some of the stuff later on will bring us back up and I'm not worried about the overall rating simply because that first segment will drag the rating up regardless of how anything else does. We then return from the break and already we've got a segment that brings up the heat of the tag team storyline because Beer Money of course have interest in those titles having not yet had their rematch. They are shown speaking with Paul Heyman and they are unhappy about being barred from the building at No Surrender. They're even more unhappy that they won't get their fair one-on-one -on -one rematch at Bound for Glory. Paul Heyman reminds them of what they did to wrestling's greatest tag team two weeks ago and says that they're lucky to even 
be here. He told them if they got involved last week as well that there'd be severe consequences. So the fact that he's not suspended them or worse, they should thank their lucky stars. They will, however, get a chance to earn a shot at Bound for Glory as they'll take part in one of those two qualifying matches next week against a mystery team. Beer Money say that Paul is trying to screw them. He's setting the odds against them and they demand to know who that team is. That is the least that Paul Heyman owes them. But Heyman's saying nothing other than the fact that this team have been waiting a very long time to get their hands on Robert Roode and James Storm. We then return to the ring and Jay Lethal makes his entrance coming to the ring with one title for the first time since Slammiversary. Lethal says that as bad as Sunday night was for him, he's got something that means more to him than the X Division Championship to fight for tonight. Wherever they are, whatever message they want to send to him, he is begging Abyss and James Mitchell to bring Maria back safely and let him deal with whatever this issue is. This isn't about her, this is between Abyss and Jay Lethal. James Mitchell then appears on the screen, sat beside Maria, who looks frozen with fear. Mitchell relishes the power being in his hands and says that there is nothing the global champion can do. Abyss then appears behind Maria and strokes her hair. Understandably, Maria jumps out of her skin, terrified by the monster. Jay's in the ring, helpless and unable to do anything to help her. He tells Mitchell that no matter what it is, he'll make it happen. Please just return Maria safely. Mitchell reiterates that they are in control, not him. This is what this is all about to James Mitchell. They will be reunited eventually, but Jay might not recognise the girl that comes home to him. So this isn't really surprising from the sadistic tormentor that is the sinister minister. And it's not that great of a segment, but like I've said multiple times, what Mitchell adds in terms of character for Abyss vastly outweighs anything that comes across in the game. Jay Lethal, unfortunately, very poor when improvising his dialogue, but I do sometimes try and cover that. The fact that he's so worried about Maria maybe is why his dialogue comes across skittish and maybe not the most coherent. Obviously, if it hurts the segment, it's not a good thing. We then switch focus to the next match. The commentators recapping the victory of Tara over Mischief a few weeks ago, which was followed by an attack from the Knockouts Tag Team Champions. Footage of this is shown before Tara's match with Alyssa Flash up next. And I just did this really because Tara's been feuding with Jazz. There's also been the rivalry with the New Age that started a couple of months ago. So with Jazz now in the rearview mirror as it were i just wanted to recap the fact that this isn't just a random match between tara and flash there is some history and some reasoning behind it again a basic segment as we go into a victory for tara over flash in 13 minutes and five seconds a widow's peak it's a decisive clean finish not much more to say about it other than that but it is a solid match and two good performances from flash and tara the idea being that Alyssa flash and mischief work really well as a team but on an individual one-on-one -on -one basis tara is still a little bit better than either of them and following her victory a focused tara grabs Flash and throws her to the outside. A little bit disrespectful, but it's showing just how much these have got under her skin and how focused she is now on what she turns her attention to next. She looks into the camera and begins to speak about the Knockouts Championship. However, having regrouped on the outside, Alyssa Flash and Mischief once again jump her from behind. Tara can't say whatever she was going to say. Presumably, she wanted to challenge Awesome Kong. That's not going to happen as the Knockouts Tag Team Champions Bitter, having both been defeated by her within the last month, take Tara down, laying her out with the heart attack before standing over her and raising their titles to end the first hour. We return to a solid segment to start the second hour. It's got sting in it, so it's no surprise, but given how things had been going recently, it was touch and go whether this would be another poor segment. Sting comes out to the ring and he explains why he wanted to speak with Jeff Hardy, saying that he got to know him and AJ Styles in the build-up to Slammiversary. And just like he said all those months ago, he sees the future of this company in Jeff Hardy, just like he does with AJ Styles. While he sees parts of both of those guys in himself, Jeff reminds him particularly of his younger self and that's why he wants to speak with him tonight. Jeff Hardy does come out and Sting says that he knows what he's been through, pointing out that in his younger years he'd been through the same. Sting says that it's difficult to be a role model but just like how Jeff grew up idolising Sting, there are a lot of people out there now who idolise Jeff. 
Sting says that he believes that Jeff can be the biggest name in the business and that is why it is so important that he listens to Sting. Staying at home isn't helping anybody. Hiding away from his issues isn't helping Jeff. Something needs to change and Sting wants to help. He says that he's had friends throw their potential away. Guys who could have been just as big a stars as he became and he doesn't want to see Jeff do the same. He wants this generation to be better than the generation that came before them. Jeff isn't ready for Sting's words and his head goes down. It's obviously really hard for him to hear this and the commentators put over as Jeff leaves up the ramp that to hear this from a childhood hero must be so difficult. We're hinting at the personal issues that Jeff Hardy's had but not yet explicitly stating them. I don't want to go too much into the dirty laundry of Jeff Hardy. That of course a reference to the fact that Jeff Hardy showed up a couple of months ago wasted on drugs and was unable to compete. Gaining heat to the storyline which is good. Jeff Hardy improvising well and overall I'm pretty happy with how that segment has gone. Of course we'll delve deeper into this as the weeks go on. As we return then for the fourth match of the evening and Desmond Wolf gets himself back into winning ways. It's a competitive match because we still want Brian Kendrick to come across as an upper mid card level guy. But his performance is a little bit lower than Desmond Wolf, justifying the decision for Wolf to pick up the victory in 11 minutes and 56 with a jaw breaker lariat. A 64 isn't that good really, but it's okay and it gets Wolf back onto winning ways, which is the most important thing. He stands tall then, delighted to have picked up a much needed victory. During the match, we will have been putting over that Wolf again has been losing those big matches. He does well on a week to week basis, but when it comes to those important Important matches he tends to come up a little bit short even now in a good moment attention is almost immediately pulled away from him as a guest is shown standing amongst the crowd in the impact zone Christy Hem is then shown and she welcomes to TNA Brian Danielson she says that he has officially signed with the company and Brian himself says that there is no better time to come into this locker room as right now this is the free agent signing that we were talking about and with Bound for Glory around the corner, he wants to get straight down to work. Brian is then approached by London and Kendrick after the match. They're old friends and they have a little bit of a chat. Desmond Wolf crashes this feel-good reunion, however, and asks Brian Danielson what he's doing here. Wolf was sure that he'd got away from him for good when they went their separate ways last year, but Brian says that he hasn't. And he's going to be in the ring next week. If Wolf has something to say, then he can say it inside the six sides. Let's not cause chaos in the crowd tonight, but he'll see him next week. So setting up that Brian will be in the ring next week. And we will, of course, have a segment between these two guys. The destined to do this forever. Again, the storyline names may give away where we're going to go. But I don't think that'll take away too much from the build to these matches. Recap gimmick changes. It gets an awful rating. Thankfully, I think I'll actually get away with that. I signed him and then put him in development with Evolve just briefly, just so that if I clicked on any screens, it wouldn't spoil it after shows and stuff like that. I then forgot to bring him up in time for the show. So the fact I've brought him in now as Borrow from development probably helps me because we'll get a second crack at the whip now. I want to talk a bit more in detail about bringing Brian Danielson in. Of course, he wasn't the big star then that he became, but in terms of the actual free agents that were available for me to sign, his six months with WWE has basically made it so that he is the most popular guy who I could have brought in, other than veteran guys who wouldn't really have been on my radar anyway. And actually bringing in Brian Danielson is one of what I'd call the three pillars of the save. Basically a scenario in 2010, a scenario in 2011, and a scenario in 2012, all three which I want to play out during the course of this save and booking Daniel Brian Danielson, that will probably not be the last time that I nearly mess up his name, but booking Brian Danielson in TNA was one of those three things. So that he's been in WWE in the save and left because I set up that scenario that he only had six months left in his contract and wouldn't re-sign. For me, it'll be easy just to say that he's got fired from WWE. It's not going to be mentioned in storyline, so it's not like I'm going to have to try and construct some reason. But the idea is that... Brian Danielson has left the WWE, so he will have had that buzz of return to the Indies. He's made appearances on Evolve, as you will have seen in a previous episode. And like I said, I think that will justify the idea of him being the hottest free agent. 
and this is like I said one of the three things in the sort of story of this save we're kind of saying that what happened in reality is what we're basing it off rather than what's happened in the last six months in the game hearing myself speak I know I've not explained that very well so if anybody has any questions or things that don't quite make sense with that ask me and I'll try and explain it better in text rather than through speech because I've rambled on a little bit there but cutting to the back, we see Larry Sweeney, Austin Creed and the new X-Division champion Kazuchika Okada in the office of Paul Heyman. Sweeney and Paul have a little bit of a back and forth on the signing of Brian Danielson before turning attention to Paul's Bound for Glory proposal, or at least that's what Larry Sweeney calls it, as he says that he's made a few tweaks that he thinks will improve the match. He hands Paul a revised contract, which Paul takes a brief look at and then hands back. Heyman says that the contract he gave to Larry wasn't a suggestion, and this isn't a negotiation. On that note, Larry smiles and extends his hand, accepting the proposal. He understands that he's in a bit of a privileged position, and him and Paul have a good relationship. He doesn't want to ruin that, and Paul thanks him for being easy to do business with, reminding him that his job now, whether he likes the match or not, is to promote the hell out of it before Bound for Glory. He trusts that Larry is going to get people on board with this match and Sweeney is happy to do that as he leads his clients away. Advancing the X Division extravaganza storyline, Larry Sweeney doing a masterful job of improvising while Paul Heyman benefits from a hot catchphrase. Sarah Del Rey then squashes Jennifer Blake. I think she got a tryout in TNA in reality. Around this time, maybe a year before, maybe a year after, she lasts 2 minutes and 18, a cross arm breaker, making her tap out. It's not a good match, but it will hopefully be good for Sarah Del Rey to pick up another dominant victory, a 57 from her is solid and after the match she takes a microphone and gets straight to the point. She believes now there is no doubt that she deserves a shot at the knockouts championship and she is done waiting. Sarah Del Rey then makes her challenge official. She wants Awesome Kong at Bound for Glory with the knockouts championship on the line. A 53 again is a decent rating. Happy with that and really happy with how Del Rey has been booked so far. Whether it's the knockouts championship match or not. We do definitely have something planned for her on 10 10 10. A video package then plays looking back on the rivalry between Bad Influence and LAX. Footage is played from Hernandez and Morgan's days as a tag team and the six months that followed after their bitter breakup. Two clear factions have formed and there is as much heat as there has ever been between the two sides right now. This war far from over, they've exchanged victories back and forth over the last couple of months and with Bound for Glory just around the corner, there may be no better time to finally blow off this long term rivalry and we follow that up with LAX coming down to the ring. They are the aggressors tonight as they appear officially as a unit for the first time. Homicide takes the lead and says that they're not waiting for a match with Bad Influence, they want to fight them right now. Bad Influence aren't backing down and they come out, a brawl quickly breaking out in the ring between the six men. Matt Morgan goes after Hernandez while Homicide and Christopher Daniels brawl back through the crowd. Everybody's out of the ring apart from Amazing Red and Kazarian. They have a little bit of history themselves going back to the start of the year when Frankie Kazarian screwed Amazing Red out of the X Division Championship. They share an exchange more of a wrestling based exchange, the other four guys are brawling whereas these two have a little bit of a back and forth. Tracy Brooks then tries to make the difference helping her husband Frankie Kazarian but Sarita is soon out to neutralise her. Sarita charges at Tracy taking her down in the ring. Kazarian then sort of withdrawing himself from his exchange with Amazing Red to drag Tracy out of harm's way. She wasn't really likely to fare well against Sarita. Amazing Red and Sarita then stand tall as the commentator has put over once again this war is far from over and these two sides hate each other more than ever a 54 is a decent rate segment but i'm more drawn to the fact that every single note here is green it even lost heat to the storyline but just those green notes make me happy so cutting to the back jerry barash is then shown outside the door of paul Heyman, reporting that he has just seen somebody leaving the office who he didn't expect to see tonight he knocks on the door to speak to paul Heyman. But when the man in charge opens the door, he looks shaken. From what we can see with the door slightly ajar, the office has been trashed and the colour has drained from Paul's face. Heyman straightens up his tie, gulps and tells JB he's back.
So a decent segment there that is just setting up something for later in the night, teasing that somebody who we haven't seen for a while is back in the company and we assume they'll make their impact at some point tonight. Returning from the break, Wrestling's Greatest Tag Team are interviewed about their match with Kazarian and Daniels next week, putting over the personal issues that they have with them. However, they see that Bad Influence have issues of their own and Hass and Benjamin are solely 100% focused on the World Tag Team Championships. That's why they came to TNA and Benjamin adds that he is feeling close to 100% and knows he'll be ready for next week. Charlie Haas is asked about the other qualifier and says that he doesn't know who the mystery team facing Bay Money will be, but they're confident that Wrestling's Greatest Tag Team will be joining Motor City Machine Guns in the full Metal Mayhem at Bound for Glory on 10 10 10. So just filling in there that Kazarian Daniels are suspected of being the guys who attacked Charlie Haas the other week, but this is all about getting into the World Tag Team Championships match, advancing the storyline with that segment as we go into our main event. And it only lasts 5 minutes and 32, but there is a good reason for that. Both guys come out of the gates because there is that heat between them. They don't hate each other or anything like that. But there's clearly some animosity over the last few weeks. And pretty quickly, we see AJ Styles setting up for that phenomenal forearm that he's done over the last few weeks. But despite having Samoa Joe right where he wants him, he is distracted as Bobby Lashley makes his return to TNA. Samoa Joe doesn't see him, but AJ does, and this allows Samoa Joe to knock AJ off the apron straight into the path of Bobby Lashley. Lashley grabs AJ Styles and launches him into the guardrail, and this, of course, results in a disqualification finish. So almost the bait and switch that we wanted people tuning in, so we gave them a big match, but it was actually because we wanted as many eyes as possible to see the return of Bobby Lashley, who makes his first appearance since Slammiversary. This wasn't about AJ Styles for him, however. Samoa Joe goes after Bobby Lashley. These two have a lot of history going back to last year's Bound for Glory, but Lashley is ready for him on the outside. Of course, Samoa Joe's just been in a fairly short match, but nonetheless, Lashley is not only more prepared, he's fresh. He knew what he was going to do. He'd planned all this out, and while Samoa Joe gets some shots in, Lashley is quickly able to take charge. This is clearly a targeted attack. Lashley is too intense, too fast, too powerful for Joe to handle at this time, and he throws him from pillar to post at ringside. He then gets these steel steps, sets them up in the ring before hitting a spine buster to Samoa Joe onto them. Lashley stands tall as the commentators sign off on the show. Anything can happen at this time of year. Bobby Lashley is back, and by taking out AJ, kind of, and then taking out Samoa Joe, he hopefully looks like a massive threat. But that's not the end of the show. We're hitting you with the double punch to end this first show on the build to Bound for Glory. As Marrow hears something in his headset, and we've got another major incident. This one has taken place in the back. As we cut to the parking lot, we see Jeremy Borash as always on the scene, but he's not his usual professional composed self. He struggles to keep his calm as he sees his friend Mick Foley shown out cold on the floor. They may have had their differences, but you're asking Jeremy Borash to report on something when we can see that his friend is in severe pain. JB tells those who arrive on the scene to work on Foley that witnesses saw him being hit with a black camper van as he exited the building to get to his own car. None of Mick's new age stablemates are anywhere to be seen, which quite conspicuous by their absence as a team of medics, like I said, work on Mick Foley. An ambulance has already arrived on the scene and Mick is loaded into it as impact goes off the air. JB does manage to compose himself temporarily, shaking his head. We can see the emotion on his face. We want him to really put across how worrying this moment is, as he explains that Mick Foley has been the victim of an intentional hit and run. The people who saw this happen were in no doubt about that. Boris then joins his friend in the ambulance, shutting the door behind him as the show goes off the air and that is how we write Mick Foley out of storyline. He's leaving the company in two days so no chance to follow this up with Mick actually involved but of course the storyline will continue and how this affects the new age going forward. A 69 rated segment advancing the storyline and 81 is a really 
Really good rating. Happy with that. I think that's probably the third or fourth best show we've done. Better than all but two pay-per-views, I think. And that is the first show on the Build to Bound for Glory. A little bit of a Mr. Anderson heavy episode of Explosion. It was sort of a theme, a thread throughout the night of him just finally losing it. And it ended with him cutting ties with everybody. Bashir, Kiyoshi, Big Rob Terry. He wants nothing to do with them anymore. And there we see the previous episode from before the pay-per-view, not too relevant, but thanks for watching and hopefully you'll join me for the next episode as we continue the build to 10-10-10. The new age is coming.